So hello and welcome to Coffee with the Dean, a series for Lent in 2022. I'm Leanna Fuller. I'm the Interim Academic Dean here at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. And I am here today with Dr. Dan Freyer Griggs, who serves at PTS as Visiting Assistant Professor of Bible and also as a writing specialist at our Center for Writing and Learning Support. Dan, it's great to be in conversation with you today. Thanks, Leanna. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, good to see you. So I thought I would just jump right in with um, some questions to start out our conversation today. Um, many pastors and other leaders are preparing to preach or teach on the passages for the lectionary that we have this week. What is one theme or learning that you would recommend they give attention to? Yeah, so um, today I thought we could talk uh, mainly about uh, two of those texts, uh, Genesis 15 and uh, Luke 13, uh, the selected passages from those chapters. Um, and, you know, both of those are, are pretty uh, symbolic and rich texts that we can dig into. But, you know, initially, uh, one thing that I'd note about each of them is that the Genesis 15 text is, is a very foundational text in the Abraham story. This is the text where uh, we have God's covenant promise made to Abraham, and we have Abraham's response to that promise in faith. Um, and say, say much more about that in a moment, but uh, with regard to Luke 13, um, we've got this text where Jesus is, is in Jerusalem, he is uh, facing his impending death, and we've got these references, you know, Herod is out to kill him, and Jesus references the, uh, the fact that the prophets uh, come to Jerusalem to die. Uh, they're, they're killed in, the, in Jerusalem. Uh, and so we see this, this resistance to Jesus. Jesus says he wants to gather uh, those in Jerusalem under his wings, and yet they're resistant. They, they choose not to. And so I think there are a lot of different directions to go with this. But one theme that I think I see uh, tying both of these texts together is that in, in these texts, we see uh, God in Genesis, and uh, in Luke, we see Jesus. Uh, extending themselves uh, to make relationship. They're, they're making these radical commitments. They're making these, taking these radical risks uh, to be in relationship with uh, stubborn people uh, who, who reject that sometimes and who struggle with that. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably the central theme that I would want to dig into here. That's great. Thank you, Dan. That's a really terrific overview. So I thought we would start um, the rest of our conversation by kind of going a little bit deeper with a couple of the, um, the scripture passages that you mentioned. So as you said, one of the lectionary passages for this week is Genesis 15, in which God promises Abram, look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. And then in verse six, it says that Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So can you help our viewers today understand what, what is it that Abram believed and how does that principle apply to Christians or help Christians today? Sure. Um, yeah, what, one thing I'd note first of all is that this verse in particular um, that Abram believed and was reckoned to him as right, righteousness is really central in the New Testament too. Um, Paul picks this up and makes this a central part of his argument in uh, Romans and in Galatians as he's talking about justification by faith. Um, James also quotes this, and there's some debate if he's responding to Paul or if he's trying to nuance Paul's argument there. Um, but regardless, uh, for both Paul and James, this verse featured very prominently in their thinking. Uh, and it can also serve for us as a reminder that, you know, for Judaism, uh, grace is prior. Um, there's, I think historically, there's been a tendency to caricature Judaism and to portray it as a, a very legalistic religion. But in this text, and especially as Paul interprets it, um, grace comes first. Paul points out that, you know, this covenant was made with Abram, and then centuries later, the law came. And so Abram responds in faith uh, in this text election precedes the law and this is something that a lot of uh, more contemporary new testament scholars have tried to urge us to uh, reconsider our uh, preconceptions about judaism so i think that's one thing to be aware of uh, as we approach these texts and we, as people preach on these themes but uh, with regard to um the, the promise this that is made to abram um 
this is that that famous scene where where Abram is told to look up at the night sky and to see uh, all the stars there to count the stars and uh, to kind of um, contemplate their vastness and it's Yahweh is making this promise to Abram that this is going to be uh, the number of your descendants. Uh, you're going to be this ancestor of these great nations. Uh, and I think it's really important to keep in mind that this promise uh, is made in the context of Abram and Sarai's struggle uh, to conceive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the text right here, it's attributed to their old age, but the fact that they only have this servant, Eliezer, as an heir suggests that they, they have no prior children. Uh, so this has been, I think, a lifelong struggle for them. Um, and so while Abram is held up as this exemplar of faith um, and he responds with this faith, uh, there's also this tension uh, with his lived experience, right? He's, yeah. he's struggled with this and uh, it's not a, a pat easy solution here. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have this tendency to take that text out of the context and, and hold Abraham up as this exemplar of faith without really acknowledging his struggle. Mm -hmm. um, and when we read the text in its context, it's pretty clear that he does struggle, um, that faith for, for Abram is, is not an easy thing. Um, you know, immediately after this text, God promises uh, also land to Abram, and Abram's response is, how, how am I going to know that I'm going to possess this? He, he responds with a question, mm -hmm. and um, maybe even more profoundly in the next chapter, um, this is the story of Hagar, and mm -hmm. where Abram and Sarai um, decide to take matters into their own hands, and um, Abram impregnates Hagar, and there's, of course, all sorts of problematic power dynamics we could think about and imagine there. But um, Abram, you know, he's not he's not perfect. He's not this uh, he is an exemplar of faith, but he's also one who who struggles. And I think there's something to explore there. Um, we often think of faith as like excluding doubt, but Abram has these profound doubts. Uh, and yet he's still considered this exemplar of faith. Yeah, that's, I actually had never thought about it quite like that before, but um, I imagine that for some people, even just hearing this story about this very particular struggle of what we assume to be infertility for um, Abram and Sarai, um, I mean, it probably hits home with a lot of people. And, and I, I imagine it also raises some pretty challenging questions for people today to think, well, you know, if I'm struggling with this thing, does, does God's promise mean that I'm going to eventually get the thing that I'm longing for? Mm. Um, or is it something more nuanced than that? I mean, in Abram and Sarai's case, they actually did eventually have a child. Um, and that's how they became, you know, the ancestors that they became uh, through a biological line. But I just wonder for, for those who may be longing for um, children or, or for something else, right. That they just are not sure they will ever be able to find, you know, what, what does God's promise mean in that context? Yeah. Um, I think that's a really challenging, uh, question. And I think one that, you know, pastors in particular should be cautious about in preaching uh, a passage like this, that, uh, it, it'd be easy to make this pat affirmation that yep. you know, if you just have enough faith, uh, right. God will provide the solution to um, to your infertility or or whatever uh, mm -hmm. you might be struggling with, and I think that would be a really destructive uh, approach to take to a text like this. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know maybe another angle that you could take on this is to you know just to focus more on this element of this relationship that persists even in the midst of that struggle. Um, mm -hmm that God is present here in this, that, um, again, Abram is this model of faith, Sarai is this uh, model of faith, uh, even prior to uh, the fulfillment of this promise. And so, yes, the, the story, and, you know, throughout the, the rest of the Old Testament, too, we see this as a recurring motif, right? We see a, a barren matriarch and then the fulfillment of this. And so uh, it's a continuous struggle in those texts, um, but one that I, I think really needs to be handled with a lot of caution and um, not to project this notion that, you know, faith will will uh, bring about a solution to this problem, that there is, you know, there is this ongoing struggle uh, that remains. Yeah, it is tempting, I think, sometimes to think of it like that, you know, that if we just believe 
hard enough or have enough faith that we will get the thing that we want or we think we need. Um, but uh, someone once said to me, well, God and Santa Claus are not the same thing, you know, <laughs> that just because you ask for something and you try to be a good person, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the way life is going to turn out. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm, I'm actually not sure that the scriptures promise us that anyway. So um, that's, it's a good thing to be reminded that, you know, the promise is in the presence. It mm. seems to me more so than a particular outcome um, in our lives that we may be hoping for. Yeah, for sure, for sure, and and this more of this commitment to this relationship. And it, if I could like back up to like, there's this other element of that text um, that um, you know a lot of readers, especially people in uh, listening to Sunday sermons, might not be aware of or might not. Uh, pick up on and and that's the the theme of the sacrifice that takes place in this text, which is a really kind of a strange, uh, almost bizarre uh, image that we see in in the text that um, you know God tells Abram not just to sacrifice these animals, but he, he asks them to like lay them out side by side or across from each other, and kind of create this pathway between them. And um, this is foreign to our culture, but it was very central to that ancient Near Eastern culture where um, sacrifice and covenant go side by side, hand in hand. And um, even to the point there was a, there's an Akkadian uh, figure of speech that it's essentially says, let's go slaughter a donkey together. And it means <laughs> let's make an agreement. Let's make a, okay. a covenant together. And um, the, the imagery of this, I think, is really striking with regard to God's commitment that he's making to Abram and Sarai. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what's being conveyed by this is, I think, again, something that's often not picked up on is that the, the covenant makers would pass through between these animals. And, and they're essentially pledging to the person uh, that they're making this covenant with. They're saying, let whatever happened to these animals happen to me if I don't keep my uh, promise to you. And yeah. uh, it's a, a pretty profound uh, image. Even in, um, in Jeremiah 34, God says uh, to those who transgress his covenant, and he says, those who transgress my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will make like the calf when they cut it in two and passed between its parts. Uh, mm-hmm. And what's really striking is that it's God making this commitment to Abram here. Yeah. Uh, God is, you know, in the image of the, the fiery uh, pot and the bl- blazing torch that passed through that, those are th- often thought to be um, representations of God's promise that God is making this commitment to Abram. And th- again, I think we see in that text, this really radical commitment to this relationship that God is making. Um, so again, um, maybe we can affirm the promise of that relationship that's being established here, uh, much more so than the, the wish fulfillment that you're, you're referencing earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, thanks. So I, I'll transition us now to talking about the other passage that you mentioned. Um, another of this week's lectionary readings is Luke 13, 31 through 35 which deals with the relationship between God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Jesus uses the illustration, which I think you referenced earlier, of a mother hen gathering her unwilling chicks under her arm. What does this image tell us about the way Jesus saw the people of Jerusalem? And what might it be saying about people in general? Yeah. Um, Yeah, so... um... One thing that's kind of interesting about this text that some people have pointed out is that uh, we also have this reference to Herod above. Uh, we've got a, a fox and a hen, uh, okay. Herod the fox and, and Jesus the hen, um, which yeah. is kind of a, an interesting juxtaposition there. But with regard to the hen imagery in particular, uh, again, this just like we saw in Genesis 15, the, the imagery, the symbolism here is, is I think, striking. Um, there's some fascinating metaphors and images that can maybe unsettle some of our presuppositions. Um, and that's an interesting question about um, God's sovereignty and, and human responsibility. I think when we Oftentimes, when we talk about God's sovereignty or we think about God's sovereignty and power, uh, we we think of kind of a controlling God, a very uh, coercive sort of power or a form of power that can like force its subjects into submission or something like that. Um, and, you know, sometimes the traditional imagery that we 
used to talk about God, maybe God as king or even as father, uh, could be taken in that way as you know very authoritarian or authoritative uh, form of power. Um, but we see something very different here in this text that Jesus is using very different imagery, um, this very maternal imagery, uh, mm -hmm. this, this mother hen who's gathering her chicks under her wings in this sort of uh, protective stance. And so, um, you know, Jesus is offering this protection to those in Jerusalem. Uh, he wants to bring them under his wing uh, and he views those, even those who would be rejecting him, uh, those who would eventually crucify him as his children uh, that he wants to bring into this relationship again. And so um, I think that might speak also to the idea of, of God's power. What kind of power is this? This is more of an, an open invitation and uh, mm -hmm. not a coercive form of power, but uh, more suggestive, more inviting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means that it's open to rejection as well. So, you know, Jesus says, how often uh, have I desired to gather you under my wings like this mother hen? Uh, and you wouldn't, you were not willing. Um, so that I think it's a, a genuine invitation. It's not not coercive as, at all. It's uh, an invitation that can be rejected, and that is a prominent theme in the Gospels as well. You know, Jesus is on his way to be crucified in Jerusalem, and and beginning all the way in Luke's Gospel, especially uh, he in I think it's, uh, Luke nine fifty one. He sets his face towards Jerusalem, and he is on the way, uh, on the way to Jerusalem throughout this gospel, and uh, with this uh, knowledge that he is going uh, to his death there. And so, again, I think we see this, this sort of divine commitment to, uh, in this case, trying to establish relationship, uh, trying to reconcile, um, mm -hmm. even at great risk, just as we saw in, in Genesis 15. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this um, distinction you're drawing between different kinds of power, you know, coercive power versus what we might call maybe persuasive power. I'm not sure, but, um, you know, it's sort of the question of, you know, who who's more powerful, the person who puts people in shackles and forces them to follow mm. or the person who convinces people to follow, you know, uh, invites and convinces. And also, as you say, um, opens the possibility that people won't you know, that people will make a different choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I was struck by, you know, the, the um, imagery of, you know, the trying to gather the chicks under the wings. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, sort of herding cats, you know, trying to get, <laughs> if you've ever seen a bunch of chicks out in a farmyard, they're just running in all directions. And sure. same thing with cats, you know, it's hard to mm -hmm. get them to do what you want. And it seems like people are very much that way too. In fact, you know, um, the Old Testament to me in particular is kind of a story of God continually inviting and Israel saying, yes, we want to be your people and then straying and then God inviting again and bringing back and sort of this dance back and forth in a way it seems like between God and God's people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, I wonder too about this idea of, you know, I, I'm not sure it was just, you know, the people of Jerusalem <laughs> that right. are that way. Oh, um no. But I think it's, you know, human beings are, are that way, it seems like. We yeah. sometimes we want to follow. We have good intentions. You know, we we do our best to follow. And then we sometimes find ourselves straying. Um, mm -hmm. And then we we need that invitation maybe to come back. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we also, we, we might feel a little bit uncomfortable with that more persuasive, suggestive sort of power. And I think sometimes we want that kind of authoritarian uh, voice telling us exactly what to do. So there's this mm -hmm. sense of clarity um, and there's this kind of simplicity to that. Um, yeah. but, but I think both of these texts are, are suggesting that it's, it's, it's otherwise, um, you know, that's not an, a real honest relationship uh, that's right. based on that dynamic. And uh, what we have here is, is more of, uh, there's more ambiguity, there's more uncertainty, uh, there's risk, uh, mm -hmm. but I think those are terms that we might use to define faith. Um, yeah. and, and so I think that would be one angle to take on, on that text as well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if we're saying that, I mean, I think most of us would affirm that scripture is you know, a record of God's relationship with God's people. And at the center of that relationship is love, I think most of us would say. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, that sort of makes me think about this power question, you know, mm -hmm. what kind of power is it that can make someone love you? <laughs> right. I'm not sure there is 
a power <laughs> like that. Maybe yeah. God does have that power, but it doesn't seem to me that that's the power that's reflected in the scriptures. Um, it does not seem to me that God is interested in trying to make people love God. Right. It seems like God is interested in inviting people to love God and be in relationship. And it also seems like there's a way in which God respects people's choice not to be in relationship. Um, it's not to say there are never any consequences for that, or, sure. uh, but it just doesn't seem to me that um, love is a thing that you can force on people. It doesn't seem to work with humans, and I just don't think mm -hmm. it probably works between God and humans either. So yeah, that's just what was kind of going through my mind is, yeah. it, to me, love and coercive power don't really go together. Mm -hmm. Not at um, all. And that's, to me, that's what the, the our scriptures remind us of, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Dan, for this conversation today. It's been really enlightening, and I really hope our viewers will um, get a lot out of it. I feel sure those who are um, being challenged to preach on these texts will get a lot out of it. So I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, well, thank you, Leanne. It's been good to chat with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.